A couple of weeks ago, we started a study that is going to take us up to Easter uh, from the Gospel of John, the Apostle, uh, where we are looking at the seven miracles between the beginning of Jesus' ministry and uh, the crucifixion itself, seven miracles that John calls signs. He calls them signs because they're more than miracles. They're actually designed to point us to who Jesus is, to tell us something about Jesus and why he came, and the reason why he writes and includes these signs, these miracles in his gospel is so that you and I may come to believe that Jesus is the son of God and that by believing we may have life in his name. And so we are uh, inching our way to Easter as we go through this, uh, through this study. And if you brought your Bible this morning, uh, I would love for you to take it out and turn to John chapter five, which is where we're gonna be. We're gonna look at a, uh, an event in Jesus' life that comes on the heels of of uh, the healing of a Roman official's um, son. And so we looked at that last week in John chapter four, and it begins in John chapter five uh, with these words. After this, after the healing of the official son, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, there were three festivals in the Jewish uh, religion uh, that uh, men were required to go to Jerusalem for, the Passover, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, the, the uh, Feast of Pentecost. And we don't know exactly which one it is. I think it was the uh, the F Passover feast, but it's not identified. Either way, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem in order to celebrate uh, this feast. And then it says in verse two, by the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades or five porches. Now, just a little bit uh, about this. Uh, for the longest time, for century after century after century, uh, critics of the Bible and uh, critics of Jesus, unbelieving people uh, would um, say, that the gospel of John is not rooted in history. It was just largely a, a theological or an allegorical gospel because John throughout his gospel mentions people, places, and timing events uh, that people said there, there is no evidence of any of this. There is no gate called the sheep gate. There is no pool of Bethesda. And then in 1888, an archeologist, don't you just love it when science catches up with the Bible? An archaeologist found what he believed was the pool of Bethesda. And at that time, it was not, um, Israel was not a nation again. They didn't become a nation until 1948. And then in 1956, six years after Israel became a nation again, they started to excavate that site in earnest and they uncovered a massive area called the Pool of Bethesda. In fact, there were two different pools, rectangular in size. Uh, they are as large as Olympic swimming pools and they found these porches, five porches, just like John says. In fact, they're so large that on one end of one of these pools, it was 42 feet deep. And it took him, and so they said, yeah, this is it. And so what I, the reason why I say this it's to let you know that the gospel of John is rooted in history. These are real people, real times and real places. This isn't just an allegory. This is something that happened and John was an eyewitness and you and I can be confident in what the scriptures proclaim to us about who Jesus is and what he did. This is real. It's not made up, it's not make-believe. And then he says in verse three, within these, within these colonies lay a large number of disabled blind, lame, and paralyzed people. And so they were here at this pool called Bethesda. By the way, uh, any of you ever remember hearing the term Bethesda or the name Bethesda before? Typically, what's that term related with? A hospital. Bethesda Hospital. Why is it called Bethesda? Why, why do they name it Bethesda? Because that's where healing took place. And so the lame, the blind, the sick, the infirmed came to this place. And then if you, if you look at your Bible, there's a little uh, footnote there. And if you look at the footnote, the verse three goes on. It says uh, in verse three, wait, why were they there? Why were all these people there? They were waiting on the moving of the water. And then the footnote will also include verse four, because an angel of the Lord would go down to the pool from time to time and stir up the water. The first one who got into the water uh, after it was, uh, the first one who got in after the water had been stirred up recovered from whatever ailment he had. 
Now you say, well, James, why, did, uh, why is this in the footnote? Why is this not in the text? Well, there's a science called uh, textual criticism, and it's where scholars and people who love the scriptures come together and try to figure out, we don't have the original manuscripts of the Bible, so how do we know exactly what was in the Bible, what should be included in the Bible, and what should not? And so they go to painstaking uh, lengths to try to figure out what is really the text of the Bible, what is really not the text of the Bible. And for centuries, they thought that these verses were appeared until in the eight, middle, middle 1800s, they found about 20 manuscripts, about 20, that did not include uh, these two parts of this verse. And so on an abundance of caution, they said, we're not sure if these should be included or not. And so they put them in the footnote. It's not that they're trying to remove something. It's so that you and I have confidence that no one's trying to slide things into the text that don't belong there. This is not being made up. These are men and women who take the scripture very seriously. And so you say, well, James, should it be in there or not? Here's my opinion. It should be. And here's why I say this, because the vast majority, thousands of manuscripts include these two verses. And there is a reason why these people are at the pool. They're not there just for sunbathing purposes. It's not vacationers who come to Jerusalem and say, hey, let's go hang out by the pool of Bethesda. They're there because they need healing. And if there weren't any healing going on, why would they show up there? They wouldn't. All right, so it goes on, verse five, we're back into the text again. Verse five, one man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. All right, now I just want to stop, set up this whole deal. Uh, In that day, if you were blind or lame, or paralyzed, you had some infirmity, uh, you were on the outs of society. People didn't uh, bother with you. They didn't look at you. The only way you survived was through, you know, begging. And so most of these people would be beggars. And they may have people who would help them get to the pool, and then they would drop them off and leave them. And the text says that this man had been coming to the pool for 38 years. It does not mean that he would have been placed there, and for 38 years he had not moved. That's not uh, how we should understand this. It is that for 38 years he keeps coming back to the pool of Bethesda because he's hoping, he's hoping that he will become healed, that he will become whole once again. And if you have a lot of blind and lame and paralyzed people, and I don't mean to be insensitive, but there is no plumbing in this day. When people were dropped off, sometimes they would stay there for days on end because no one was there to help them uh, back and forth. And so you can imagine uh, the stench that this place carried because of the human excrement. And it says that this man had been coming back to this place again and again and again, hoping, hoping, hoping that he would receive healing. Verse six, it says this, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? And you might say, well, Jesus, that's kind of a foolish question. Actually, it's not a very foolish question at all. Sometimes we get used to our pathetic life, don't we? Sometimes we get used to our sins. Sometimes we get used to our suffering. Sometimes we get used to what chains us down. There's this thing uh, that we call in psychology today, uh, codependency. Codependency is a thing where you're enabling someone else and it's not healthy for them and it's not healthy for you, but you know of no other way. And so you just exist in that codependent relationship. Why? Because it's what you know. Battered wife syndrome, right? Why why don't you flee? Well, it's because it's what I know. I can't. And so sometimes uh, God comes to us and says, do you really want to be well? Do you really want to be well? It's not an automatic question. And in this text, we see that Jesus, uh, if there are a great multitude, which uh, the scripture says there that there are large crowds, other translations called a great multitude in other places in the gospels, when a great multitude was named, it it was basically talking about thousands of people. And so in this place, which is large enough to carry thousands of people, Jesus sees one guy, among the hundreds at least, if not thousands, and he crawls over all these people going to this one guy. And he comes up to him and he's seeing this, this mass of uh, you know, you know, humanity 
in this place where no one wants to go. No one goes to the pool of Bethesda to hang out, just, you know, get a cup of coffee. That's not what we do at the pool of Bethesda. And yet Jesus goes there, which gives me another thought here as we go through this text. It is so amazing in this that we see the nature and the heart of Jesus that he will go into the, into the worst part of our lives to help. The part of our lives that we don't want anyone to know about that is so dark and so sinister and so filthy and that he says, it's okay, I know. And I'm coming here on purpose to meet you, which is exactly what he does to this man, this man that is paralyzed or with some kind of an illness, we don't know for sure. And they ask him, do you want to be made well? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just want to be left alone. And in this um, whole event, we find that Jesus does not force himself onto us. He doesn't go in and just walk up to the guy and say, hey, get up. He first asks him a question. Jesus is not gonna force himself on you. <laughs> He's gonna call you out. He's gonna invite you. He's gonna ask you a question. Do you wanna be, do you wanna, uh, be free from this season that you're in, the situation that you're in? Do you want freedom? Do you want to be released from this? Do you want healing? It's an honest question. And it's a good question. Verse seven, sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Again, it harkens back to uh, verse three and four where something was happening there. So people believed that, um, you know, you were gonna get healed. And if people didn't get healed, why would people be there year after year after year? Something was happening. I have no one there to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am uh, coming, someone else goes on ahead of me. Like, I, I'm here. And I wonder if this, uh, this man, after 38 years of this existence, if he hadn't uh, lost hope. Maybe you walked in here today. Maybe you're listening online and you feel like, you know what, I, I don't even know why I try anymore. Like for a long time I did and, and it just nothing is changing. I don't see any movement. And so perhaps this man showed up that day thinking, I don't even know why I'm here. And yet, and yet Jesus shows up and goes to him specifically. There's a reason I think, and we're gonna find this out in the text later on. There's a reason why he comes up to him. And it's not just because of a heart of compassion, although Jesus does have a heart of compassion. He wants to do something in this man's life, not just the physical healing, although he does receive physical healing, there's something else. We'll see that in the text in just a moment. And so Jesus looks at this man in verse eight and he says, get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Now, um, a lot of people have different views of Jesus that he's meek and mild and gentle uh, and all. But as you actually read through the gospels and understand what's happening, as you read through the gospels, there are a lot of things that Jesus says that are just insensitive. For example, let's say, and, and we've probably all known somebody who's been bound to a wheelchair for a period of time. And if you're bound to a wheelchair for a period of time, especially decades, there is extreme atrophy. There is, there is no muscle in the legs. There's, there's nothing. And let's say that you have been in that situation. You personally have been in that situation for decades and you go to the mall with someone who's you know, wheeling you around and some stranger comes up to you because this man had no idea who Jesus was. He'd never seen him, never heard of him. And someone comes up to you and says, uh, do you want to be well? And you would probably be a little startled at that and you would say, well, of course I, I, you know, of course I want to be well. And then what if that stranger looked at you and said, well, you should get up, just start walking. Um, if that were me and if that were you, you would probably try your best to knock him in the nose. You know, you'd be like, what, what do you mean get up? I would thought maybe you were a doctor and you'd found some, you know, spinal cord thing that, you know, could make my, you know, have feeling in my legs. You just... You're being rude, you're being mean. And this is exactly what Jesus does. Do you wanna be well? Well, yeah, it's kind of, this is why I'm kind of here. It's, well, get up. 
Pick up your mat and go home. Now, Jesus tells this man, it's a command in the, in the Greek language. Jesus commands this man to get up. He's commanding this man to do something that he is unable to do on his own. Do you realize that uh, Jesus comes to you and to me all of the time and asks us to do things that we are unable to do on our own? He's saying, I, I, can't, I can't do this. And I wonder if in the first moment when he heard these words of Jesus, if he said, I can't do this. Let me just tell you something. When Jesus comes to you and says, this is what I want you to do, do it. Don't give him excuses as to why you can't. If you want to walk in freedom, then do what he's inviting you and commanding you to do. And he looks at this man and he says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. He hasn't walked in 38 years. He has no muscle, no tone, nothing. The audacity of Jesus. And then it says in verse 9, and instantly, not a few hours later, not a few days later, not a few weeks, not a couple months later, instantly the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. John is an eyewitness of what happened here. There are many people who are eyewitnesses of what happened here. And John says, we walked into this place and Jesus walks over. He goes over to this one guy, talks with him, and then just looks at him and says, get up, take your mat and walk. And as soon as Jesus says this, the guy gets up and he starts walking and he picks up his mat. He picks up his mat. Um... This is the very thing that the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, what we call our Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures would uh, prophesy, would foretell about the coming Messiah, the coming King, God's anointed one. That when the Messiah came, these kinds of things would be happening. And so John makes sure he's like, oh, you got to understand what Jesus is doing here. Why? Because it's pointing to who Jesus is. In uh, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6 is what it says. Then the eyes of the blind in the age of Messiah, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. All these happened in the ministry of Jesus. And so John is picking these things out and he's like, I'm just telling you, this is Messiah. This is Messiah. And so this man begins, he gets up and walks. His legs regain strength that they haven't had in decades. And he starts to walk. He picks up his mat. And um, at this point in the text, the text turns and we begin to understand why John signals out this sign from Jesus. It's not just about a healing of a man who'd been lame for 38 years. It's not uh, about him as much as it is about something that is greater, something that Jesus is going in. And what we'll find is Jesus with his audacity, he, he has no fear. He goes in and he just pokes the bear. How do you know that, James? Well, what it says in the rest of the verse. Now on that day, now that day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, and this is how they respond, this is remarkable. Give glory to God for his mercy and grace to bring you complete healing and wholeness. I mean, anybody in their right mind would see this man who'd been there for decades, all of a sudden he's walking around carrying his, wouldn't you celebrate with him? Wouldn't you say, oh my goodness, God is great? Well, this verse is in the, not in the Bible translation, NIB and right down there. That's not how they respond. Here's how they really respond. This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. We don't care if you've been healed. They don't care one iota about this guy. They care about their power. And they see this guy afterwards. Uh, they have no idea where he came from. And they see him walking across the way, picking up his, his mat, carrying his mat. Hey, you're breaking the rules. It's the Sabbath. You can't carry your mat. 
Do you know where the Old Testament scriptures say that people can't carry their mat on the Sabbath? Do you know where that is? What, what verse that is? I'll tell you. There isn't a verse that says that. This is what the law says. Exodus chapter 20, verse eight to 10. Remember the Sabbath, this is the 10 commandments. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You're to labor six days and do all your work. You know, your job that earns food and, you know, keeps your family alive, those kinds of things. You're to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And then it says, you must not, next verse, you must not do any work. Who's you? You, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, I mean, the animals, the resident alien who's within your city gates. They're like, hey, look, you've been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. You never had a day off. They worked you to death. I'm bringing you out. I'm giving you freedom. And I'm telling you, you are not to work every day of your life. You are to rest. You're to rest. Can I get an amen? Oh, golly. Some of you, some of you, some of you people, you need to take a day off. The Sabbath, we're not bound by it, but we know if I don't take a day off, man, I, I'm gonna implode. Some of you are at that point. The Sabbath is is made to restore you, not to bind you. And what the religious leaders had done through the years was they tried to figure out, well, what is work? What does work mean? And then they came up with all kinds of little nitpicking things about what work was. For example, I'm not making this up. For example, they would say, you can't carry a needle in your robe because that would constitute work. You can't, ladies, you can't wear a brooch because it's too heavy. And if you walked around, that would constitute work. No, it doesn't. And so they came up with 39 different things and categories and then all kinds of things underneath those that said, and then they would tell people, here's the law of God. And it wasn't the law of God, it was their law. It was their rules. And they were trying to force people to obey them instead of God. And so they said, you're breaking the, you're breaking the Sabbath. And he wasn't. Verse 11, the text goes on. He replied, the man replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. I, I, I don't know if I'm breaking the Sabbath or not. I'm just telling you, I've been laying over there for 38 years. No one pays any attention to me. This guy comes right over here. He tells me, you know, hey, do you want to get well? I'm like, sure, I want to get well. Well, pick up your mat and walk. And so I do. And I'm breaking the law. But the man, oh, verse 12, who is this man who told you pick up your mat and walk? They didn't know. They had no idea what was going on. It's like, hey, you're breaking the law, but if he healed you on the Sabbath, that's against our rules too. You can't be healed on the Sabbath. You can die on the Sabbath. You can't be healed on the Sabbath. So you're breaking the law and this other guy is breaking the law. Who is he? Verse 13, but the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus was a stranger. Jesus had slipped away in the crowd that was there. He says, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy starts picking up his mat and walks and everybody's looking at the guy walking and Jesus kind of just slips out because he's not there to make a scene. He's there to bring something to a head. Verse 14, after this, after the man had been grilled by the religious leaders, after this, it says, verse 14, Jesus found him in the temple. Why was it in the temple? He was in the temple because the Old Testament law said, if you, you know, something like this happens, you offer a sacrifice of praise to God in Thanksgiving. And so perhaps that's why the man was there. And Jesus said to him, see, you are well. A lot of people uh, think that sometimes healings are psychosomatic. They're, you know, they're just, uh, all of a sudden, it's not really a real healing. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, you're still well, aren't you? This is the real deal. This is a real bona fide miracle. And Jesus says, you're so well. And then Jesus says something, and this is why I think he picked this man. 
Out of the hundreds that were there, he picked this man because he not only needed healing, he needed something else. There was something happening in his soul. He had been bound in his soul. And Jesus says this statement that kind of throws everybody off. This is what he says. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. What? What? Now, a little comment uh, is necessary here because this is a little confusing for a lot of people. A lot of people think that, hey, if I don't uh, do what God wants, that he, you know, he's going he's gonna to blast me. He's going to, you know, thunder, you know, lightning bolt. Uh, he's going to punish me in some way. And a lot of people say, ah, that's not how God works. And the honest truth is sometimes God does. And I would be derelict in my duty if I just kind of glossed over this. Sometimes God does. Not all the time, but sometimes he does. Seldom does God do this, but sometimes he does. And apparently, the reason why Jesus picked this man out was not just because he needed physical healing and not just because it was going to be a miracle, but because there is something in his life that needed to be restored and renewed and set free spiritually. And Jesus says, you're well, you're walking around, you're still well, right? Listen, there's a reason why you've had this ailment for the last 38 years. Don't go back to your old life. Sometimes when we find freedom, we're tempted, aren't we? To slide right back into our old pattern. And Jesus says, don't you dare do it. I've set you free. I've set you free. You say, well, James, should I be go around walking Scared all the time that if I do something wrong, God's going to, you know, blast me into smithereens. No, God doesn't punish us in that way. If we're in Christ, all of our punishment was placed on Jesus, although he does sometimes discipline us. And don't think that because you've done something evil or bad or, you know, that God will punish somebody else in your life because of what you've done. That's not how God works. God disciplines us, not somebody else because of us. A little later, and we'll come to this text uh, in John, John chapter 9, verse 3, the disciples and Jesus uh, encounter a man who had been born blind. And the disciples, because they thought, this is the way they thought, they said, who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, we believe that there's a reason why this man was born blind, and it has to do with sin. And Jesus said, no, no, it has nothing to do with sin. And so... You've got Jesus on the one hand saying this has nothing to do with sin. And yet on this occasion, Jesus is looking at this man in private saying, hey, don't sin anymore. Because if you keep on down that path, uh, worse things are going to happen. So what do we understand? How are we to take this? Um, Sometimes God does use ailments to discipline us, to get our attention in fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, he would, say, he would say that many in the church in Corinth, because of the severity of their sin, had fallen ill, deathly ill, and some had even died because of the severity of their sin. And Paul gives a warning. And some of you think right now, it's like, well, gosh, nothing bad is happening in my life. That must mean that I'm okay with God. Not so fast. Because the Apostle Paul would write this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, or 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Like, God may never bring any kind of discipline in your life right now, but ultimately, you'll end in destruction. And so it is true. Sometimes God uses physical ailments to get our attention. And sometimes he doesn't. But the point is, we're never gonna escape those things because we will sow. We will reap what we sow, Paul says. And so after this, going back to our text in verse 15, After Jesus said this, the man went and reported, because now he's had a conversation with Jesus. He's found out who he is. He's got his name, phone number, cell phone, all that. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. It's like, hey, I'm not making this up. I'm telling you, this dude, he showed up, did the thing. 
And now I got his name. I just met him in the temple. He's there. We had this conversation. It's Jesus. You want to know who it is? It's Jesus. He wasn't trying to turn Jesus in. He's just trying to say, hey, this guy did something for me. Don't you want to do the same thing when Jesus does something for you? You want to just let everybody know? It's what he does. Verse 16, therefore, 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 the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. They cared not one whit about the suffering of people. They just cared about the rules, nice and tidy. And there's a lesson there for us that we should care, as Jesus does, about the suffering of those around us. And Jesus, verse 17, I love this. So now he's drawn the religious leaders out purposefully. He did this on the Sabbath. He could have done it on a Monday. He could have done it on a Wednesday, but he does it on a Saturday, on the Sabbath, for the express person, purpose to actually bring confrontation to these people. Verse 17, Jesus responded to them, my father is still working and I'm working too. You guys think that God's not doing anything. Some people think that God wound the world up, walked away from it. That's what a deist would believe. Yeah, there's a God, but he's not involved. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. My father <laughs> is intimately involved in everything that is happening. And I am also. He didn't wind it up and walk away. He created and ceased from his creation, but he has been working. And on the Sabbath, he doesn't take a Sabbath off because there is still suffering and hardship and misery. And he knows, and he's willing to reach those in those points of need, even in the uh, inconvenient times of those who have all their rules. God doesn't care about your rules nor mine. And neither does Jesus. He's going to do what he sees the Father doing. This is a remarkable statement. A lot of people say, well, Jesus didn't really claim anything special. And oh, contraire. Verse 18. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Now they're persecuting him. They're coming after him. Now they're like, we want this guy dead. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, in other words, their rules on the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself what? equal with God. This dude thinks he's God in human flesh. Now, if they were mistaken, if they misunderstood Jesus' words, and that happens all the time these days, right? Somebody makes a statement and then they get called out for it. And they're like, oh, you misunderstood. I, my, my statement was brought out of context. Jesus doesn't say that, does he? He's like, yep, you got it. Absolutely. What else you got? They knew what he was claiming. They knew that he was claiming to be God in the flesh, equal with God. And Jesus doesn't cut and run after this. He just stays right in. He just, he stays right in the pocket. You know, the linebacker's coming right at him. He's like, come on, bring it. Verse 19, Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. Question, question, question. Can you say that of yourself? Can you say, you know what? I, <laughs> throughout my day at, at my work, at, you know, when I'm playing golf or tennis or fishing or whatever it is that you're shopping or, you know, horseback riding or I don't know, skydiving, I'm watching for what God's doing around me. I'm looking at the opportunities he's opening up in front of me. And, and, and when I see those opportunities, when I sense that God is moving, that I wanna join him in that. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is looking for God and then following him, doing what he wants. Jesus saying, look, I, I'm only doing what I see the father doing. I'm only doing what God wants me to do. My whole life is about that. My whole, is your whole life about following Jesus that way? Is Jesus, and I've said this before, is Jesus your buddy or is he your king? Because there's a difference. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing and he will show him greater works than these. You, 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 think, what I, you think this is a big deal? I'll tell you what, there's greater things coming. 
and you will be amazed. Verse 21, and just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so the Son also gives life to whom he wants. What? They believed that God could raise the dead. And Jesus said, yeah, 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 so can I. Now, there are two different things here because he comes back to this in just a second. He's talking here about spiritual death. I'm going to raise people up spiritually, but he's going to talk about physical death and raising people from the grave in just a second. Verse 22, the father, in fact, judges no one, but gives all judgment to the son. Like, in other words, um, you may not like me, but, but I actually am going to be your judge. Why? Because God, who's the only one who's able to judge, because he's the only one perfect and holy and righteous and all those, yep, that's me. Unbelievable statements. Why so? Verse 23, so that all people may honor the son, now watch this, may honor the son just as they honor the father. Anyone who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. If you want to worship God, you got to worship me. When you worship God, you are worshiping me. If you're going to honor God, you're going to honor me because no one can honor God without honoring me. We're one and the same. There are a lot of people these days, a lot of religions, Islam and Unitarianism and Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't honor Jesus as the way they honor God. And Jesus says, you got it wrong. By necessity, if you're going to honor God, you have to honor me because we are the one and the same. And then Jesus says, uh, he's on a roll, isn't he? This is why I love Jesus. Like, you know, he's not just floating around, you know, all meek and mild. He's going right at it. And he says in verse 24, truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Boom. That's it. This whole sign, this whole miracle, this whole thing is to get to this point. We're saying, I, I, I'm just telling you, if you hear my word and believe in the one who sent me, you will have eternal. Who says that? No man would say that. No no man in his right mind would say that unless he's able to heal people who've been paralyzed for 38 years. Unless he's able to heal someone who's 20 miles away, has no idea where this person is, but just instantly the very time he says this, he's healed. He can turn water to wine. Wouldn't you like to see that one every now and then today? Um, who says this? The son of God says this, that's who. And John says, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, we thought Jesus was pretty special, but then I saw him do all of these things and my goodness, again and again and again. And I'm just telling you, he is the son of God who gives life. He goes on, verse 25, truly I tell you an hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who here will live spiritual resurrection for just as the father, verse 26, has life in himself. Now listen, just as the father uh, has life in himself. In other words, God is life. Life originates from God. Just as God has life in himself, so also he has granted the son to have life in himself. That is, I mean, these are big statements, right? Because just a little while longer and they would crucify Jesus and um, you can't crucify life. He didn't have somebody out, you know, waving a wand in front of the tomb, trying to bring him back. He came back on his own power by the power of God that is in him. And see, he's, um, he's saying all these things and he's setting them up. And you have to understand, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just tell, I'm putting road signs down so that you know exactly who I am. By what I say, by what I claim, and by what I do. Verse 27, and he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the son of man. Do not, verse 28, do not be amazed at this because the time is coming when you, when all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus would later, and we're going to look at this one, would later call Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, out of the grave. 
Lazarus, come forth. When uh, the, uh, the crucifixion and um, the resurrection of Jesus happened, it is reported that hundreds of people in the city and around Jerusalem came out of their graves, like dead people coming out of their graves. Jesus is saying, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you understand, hey, I, I, I talked about this. And I've told you who I am and I've demonstrated who I am so that you will not miss it. Who is Jesus? He's the son of God who came to set the prisoners free and to redeem us. He comes into the mess, our mess of life and just says, do you wanna be made well? Um, Do you wanna be saved? Do you wanna be saved? Do you wanna have eternal life? I'm not gonna force it on you. Bottom line, belief in Jesus removes condemnation and brings eternal life. But belief in Jesus removes condemnation and brings eternal life. I, I, uh, you know, we, we want Jesus meek and mild and, you know, he loves everybody and doesn't, you know, he wouldn't condemn anybody. He just accepts everybody and, you know, affirms everybody. And he just is, you know, just all happy and jolly. That's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is the one who meets us in our sin and says, hey, 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 I'm just telling you, this whole deal is because of your sin. Stop sinning or something worse is gonna happen. That's truth, isn't it? Like I'm here to redeem and renew and call you out and save and heal. Don't go back to your old way of life. Don't do that. And I'm just telling you that there's gonna be a day when everyone, 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 not some, but everyone will come out of the grave and they'll either be raised to a resurrection of life or they will be raised to condemnation for all of eternity. That's what Jesus said. That's not what I said. That's what he said. And so we are faced with this Jesus, the one who had no fear, who controlled every aspect of his life, who calculated everything that he did and now you're faced with him and so am I the son of God equal with God God in human flesh who says I have life in me just as God does James what do we do with all of this well a couple things the first thing is resist man-made legalism. Resist man-made legalism. There are things that God commands us to do and not to do and to participate in and not participate in. I'm not talking about that. That's not legalism. That's obedience to God. Um, but when we start adding our own rules to God's rules and then we want to try to bind people to, to our stuff, that's wrong. And when I was growing up early, little kid, um, it was common in the circles I ran in and the families that I ran in that, you know, if you played cards, you're going to hell. I mean, we just knew it. There's a verse in the Bible somewhere, we just couldn't find it. <laughs> and it didn't have to be poker, it could be anything. It could be anything. I mean, we also knew that people who went to the pool hall were going to hell. Why? Because we just, we just knew. We shamed people for doing things that we just were sure dishonored God. And then we got set free from that. We play cards all the time now. We just had a card game last night at the Brumman house. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Yahweh. But don't resist this man-made legalism. Don't bind people to things that aren't in the Scripture. Jesus invites us to follow him, to obey him, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. That's not legalism, that's obedience and love. The second thing is don't lose hope, don't give up hope, don't give up hope. Some of you, I mean, this man, 38 years, you would think he's just going through the motions at this point. Some of you walked in here today and you're just thinking, I don't even know why I'm trying. And here you're sitting here thinking, I can't believe he's talking about this right now. I'm just telling you, don't, don't give up hope. Why? Um, because Jesus came back from the dead. Resurrection power. 
flows through him. Anything is possible. Don't lose hope. And finally, believe in Jesus as the Son of God. That's why John wrote his gospel. <laughs> That's why John picked all of these things. He, he wanted us to know that Jesus knows the deep pain and shame of our lives, and he's there, and he'll call us by name, and he'll call us out. He'll step over everybody to get to us, and that's all true. And then he says, hey, don't go back to that old way of life. Don't walk to honor God. And if you've never, you know, if you've never, ever just really surrendered your life to Jesus, if you never believed in Jesus as the Son of God, not like a good moral teacher, not like a prophet, but God in human flesh. That's why John writes his gospel. And that's why every week leading up to Easter, we're doing a deep dive in these texts. So that if you've never believed in the name of the Son of God, you may have eternal life. And for those of you who have, <laughs> your heart would swell with confidence that you follow a risen Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You are good and gracious and kind. We're grateful for these eyewitness testimonies and events that happen in real history, real time and space. God, would you renew us and bring hope? Would you bring healing? Physically, you know, relationally, spiritually, and God, would you just give us joy that you know us by name and you're willing to enter into the mess of our lives to redeem us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.